Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the first of our little mini review lectures. So with these review lectures, I'd like to review some topics that we've covered in the class this semester. But we're going to do it by having a little fun applying these tools that we've learned to specific topics. So today, we're going to look at the physics of cats. And we're going to apply just a couple of the tools we learned just as kind of, re of re a review and as kind of a, a demonstration for how we use these tools we've learned to do what we call a back of the envelope calculation. Okay, I think I mentioned this at the very beginning of the semester. This class is the kind of class that should enable you to do kind of a, a back of the envelope calculation, which means kind of an approximation of a system that gets you kind of a rough answer, okay, that gets you in the ballpark. So let's start by looking at speed. And remember, we introduced the idea of speed as the magnitude of velocity in the very beginning of the class, right? And the average house cat, with no special training or anything like that, can run at speeds of about 30 miles an hour, okay? And this is about 13.4 meters per second. So we'll say V cat equals 13.4 meters per second, okay? So how fast is 30 miles an hour? It's pretty quick, right? The fastest human being in the world is Usain Bolt, who managed to run during one of his better 100 meter dash performances, so V of Usain, he reached a top speed of about 12, 0.28 meters per second. Okay? And for just for comparison, an average human's top speed when running just flat out when sprinting is usually closer to like 7 meters per second, a little over 7 meters per second maybe. Okay? So Usain was really flying here and he was still a little bit slower than your average house cat. Okay? But really, how much slower is that? So if a cat and Usain Bolt started at the same time and both ran 25 meters at their top speed, we see that the average house cat would be ahead. But how far ahead would the cat be when they reach the end of 25 meters? Okay, 25 meters is like 82 feet. Okay. So obviously, we know our, from our first physics tool that we learned in this class, 1D kinematics, Right? That's what we would use to solve this kind of question, right? to answer this. So let's use 1D kinematics to look, to look at this. And remember, 1D kinematics was this. So let's look at this. And when we look at this, if they're both just having this speed, that's their top speed for the whole 25 meters, then if we say that D equals 25 meters, okay, the distance of the race, then we know for the cat, it reaches D at V cat times T, and we just gave him this constant velocity, so acceleration is zero, and we can set our coordinate system so that X naught is zero, right? And that tells us that T equals D over V cat right? And then for Usain, the question is, where is he at that time, right? So x, his position, is just going to be v Usain times time, which is going to end up being vu over vc and d. And then uh, our units, of course, the meters per second cancel, and d is a distance and x is a distance. So, okay, units work, right? And the faster that Usain runs, the less far behind he'll be at the end. So, what is this? What, if we plug in these numbers, what x do we get? So if we plug in the numbers, we get 22.9 meters, okay? Which means he's about 2.1 meters behind the cat when they both finish, okay? So he's about seven feet behind. So he gets, the fastest guy on earth gets beat 
uh, pretty handily by the cat. But that was a, a painfully simple example, right? Like, that wasn't even back of the envelope. That was just, that was a really, really s simplified version of, of calculating this, right? Because we know that's not really how things run, right? They don't just start at their top speed and then always run at their top speed. That's not how things run at all, right? So they have to accelerate to get moving. And what kind of accelerations can Usain Bolt and a house cat obtain, okay? So now let's get into a little bit more interesting back of the envelope calculation, and let's look at that. So if we want to look at the race between Usain Bolt and a house cat in a little bit more interesting way, uh, we, can, we can look at this in a little more detail, and we can say, we know that to run, their legs have to push them forward, right? Whether it's the cat or it's Usain, in both cases, the legs have to push them forward. And we can get an idea of how hard the cat's legs can push it forward, right? And the way that we can do that, the way we can get this idea is if you go and look for videos, you can find videos regularly of a cat jumping about five or six feet in the air, okay, from a standing start. And uh, they do that all the time, okay? That's not abnormal for a house cat. So what kind of force is involved in this? The average mass of a house cat is around four kilograms, okay? Some are a little fatter, some are a little skinnier, but usually right around four kilograms, okay? About nine pounds. And a five foot jump is 1.5 meters. So let's start this little kind of investigation by just using 1D kinematics to find the initial velocity of a cat in this jump. So if h is 1.5 meters and we use our 1D kinematics equation, we know that it's going to end at h, right, and it's going to have some initial velocity times t minus 1 half g t squared, right? And we know that at the top of the jump, we can apply this kinematic equation, right? And at that top of the jump, it's going to have zero velocity. Because if it has a velocity, it's not at the top of the jump. If it has an upward velocity, it's still going up, so it hasn't reached the top of the jump. And if it has a downward velocity, it's already started coming down. And so it's also not at the peak of the jump. But right at the peak of the jump, it's going to have zero velocity. And that's going to be V0 minus GT, which tells us that T equals V0 over G, right? And so then H equals V0 squared over G minus one half V0 squared over G. And that equals V naught squared over 2G. Okay? And so V naught equals 2GH in a root. Just like we found so many times before, right? You guys all knew that's what I was going to come up with, but we still did the, did the process here just to show it one last time, right? So the V naught is root 2GH. And that makes V0 for the cat about 5.4 meters per second. Okay? But then we can go a step further than that, right? What's more interesting is the kind of force that the cat generates, right? And so if we remember our impulse momentum theorem, Impulse momentum theorem says that the net force, right, times delta t equals delta p. And delta t is just the time that the cat spends in the jump, okay? And we're going to call that about 0 0.7 seconds, okay? That might be a little long, but 
it's a pretty good approximation that it takes a little, you know, less than a second to, to, to engage in the act of jumping. Okay? And then delta P, of course, the initial momentum is zero, right? The cat's just sitting there. And the final momentum is just M V naught, right? This V naught from up here. Okay? So we can use the impulse momentum theorem to find the net force on the cat during this jump. And the impulse momentum theorem says that the net force is delta P over delta T, which is equal to the mass of the cat times root 2GH, V naught, right, over this delta T. And that gives me a force of 30.9 newtons. But I could do the same thing for Usain Bolt, right? For Usain Bolt, his mass is going to be mu equals about 94 kilograms was the best information that I could find, okay? And uh, the best I could find for his vertical leap is h Usain equals 1.1 meters, okay? And then I can do this same calculation, I can assume about a 0.7 second time to jump for Usain as well, and that gives us a force of 624 newtons. And these are net forces, right? The impulse momentum theorem tells us that the net force on the object that causes the change in momentum uh, is multiplied by t to find that change in momentum, right? So the forces on the jumper are the force of the jump upward and the jumper's weight downward, right? Whether it's the cat or Usain. So for the net force to be this value, the force applied by the jumper's legs has to be the force of the jumper's weight plus this net value, right? But when they're moving horizontally, Usain and the cat still have to support their weight, right? Their, their legs have a certain amount of power, but some of that power still has to be used to support their weight. So we'll assume that this net force is the force that they can apply horizontally when accelerating to run, okay? So their legs can apply this much net force, and all we're saying is that the vector, right, when they jump, this is the vector of the, I wrote V because I'm saying vector, but of the force, right? And all we're saying is that net force isn't going to change as we take the vector around anywhere in this angle, okay? So instead of pointing it up to jump, we're going to say that they can apply the same vector horizontally to run. And indeed, it turns out that when they test uh, athletes, football players and things like that, a good way to tell how fast a guy is going to be over really short distances Okay, uh, that kind of explosive speed that's really useful in football where everybody's kind of at a standing start and then they snap the ball and everybody runs as fast as they can. A really good way to figure out how fast somebody's going to be in that kind of situation is actually to test their vertical leap. It turns out that this works really well. Okay, so if we use these force values, what acceleration can each of them create horizontally? So for the cat, AC equals 7.7 .7 meters per second squared, okay? And for Usain, acceleration equals 6.6 .6 meters per second squared, right? Because F equals MA, and in the horizontal direction, the only force that's being applied is this, this net force that we calculated, okay? And so the A is just F over M. So Usain creates a much bigger force than the cat, but he has to move a much bigger object, right? His body versus a cat's body. And so in the end, his acceleration isn't quite as big as the cat's, okay? And that, that's expected. That's, that's what we know from 
all of the other kind of physics calculations we've done this semester. So we know that the cat doesn't just have an advantage in top speed, right? It doesn't just have a higher top speed than Usain Bolt. It has better acceleration as well. So let's put this together and let's try to get a better picture of our 25 meter race, okay? Let's say that initially they can both accelerate with these accelerations, right? These two here. But then we know that they can't keep up that level of force required for jumping. Jumping is an act where you, you exert kind of as much force as you can, as fast as you can, right? And you can't keep that kind of exertion up forever, right? In fact, you can't keep it up for very long at all. And so their accelerations are going to decrease as they run. They're not going to have this constant acceleration during the race, right? They're not going to be able to run 25 meters with this kind of acceleration, okay? So how does their acceleration decrease? Well, I found some really nice uh, information where somebody just plotted Usain Bolt's position over one of his 100-meter dashes, and then they took the derivative of that and they found his velocity, and they took the derivative of that, and they found his acceleration, okay? Just based on his position, and these were numerical derivatives. So they were just plots. They didn't have any functions or anything like that. They just showed plots. And I looked at the plots, and first off, his initial acceleration, it was really close to 6.6 .6 meters per second squared, okay? It was actually quite close. And that's where I got this top-end speed that I mentioned earlier. This was the maximum speed that he reached in that race, and he reached it at about 7 seconds seconds into the race. And so I looked at the plot of his acceleration and I just looked at the shape of it and I was like, oh, that looks like exponential decay. Okay, that's the shape that that thing looks like for the first seven seconds of the race. And then after he reached his top speed, of course, then it stopped even being ex exponential decay and it, he started to actually decelerate. Okay, so once he reached a top speed, he couldn't just keep that indefinitely. He actually started to slow down a little Okay, so that's fine. Our race is only 25 meters, so we're not going to have to worry about them slowing down. But we can also model our acceleration as an exponential decay function. Okay, so we can say that the acceleration is A equals A naught, okay, times E to the minus T over tau. And A naught is one of these accelerations, okay, for either the cat or for Usain. And this e to the minus t over tau, well, that's just an exponential decay function, right? And that's going to give us an acceleration that in time, if this is A and this is t, looks like this. Remember when we had um, the damped oscillators? We had an amplitude that had exponential decay in it, right? So in time, the amplitude looked like this. Well, that's what their acceleration is going to look like in time. And this, this tau here is a constant with units of seconds. And what it is, is the time that it would take for the acceleration to be about 37% of its initial value, okay? So we have to decide a time over which this thing will decrease by, you know, 63%, okay? Now, for Usain, I think that this time is around 1.9 seconds, okay? And so that's what we're going to make it. We're going to make tau of Usain about 1.9 seconds. And cats... Cats are faster than people, but they don't have the kind of endurance that people have, okay? So I'm going to make this even a little shorter for the cat. I'm going to say it can have this burst of speed, but it can't keep this uh, acceleration as high as long, okay? Its acceleration drops off faster because it has less endurance. So I'm going to say tau for the cat is equal to 1.75 seconds, okay? So... Let's, um, let's clean up this page a little bit. A whole bunch of these things aren't really needed anymore. A whole bunch of these variables we're not going to really use anymore. 
So let me erase a bunch of these and just keep the ones that we're going to care about, okay? Okay, so let's recap how we got here a little bit. We were talking about how much faster a cat is than Usain Bolt, and we talked about how the cat would have better acceleration too. And remember, what we did was we used the vertical leap of a cat versus Usain Bolt, and we calculated the change in momentum using the impulse momentum theorem. Well, we calculated the change in momentum using 1D kinematics to find the initial velocity that they must have to have a vertical leap of that height, right? Then we used the impulse momentum theorem and we assumed a time uh, that it takes them to jump and found the force that they would have when jumping. And then we used that force to figure out what their acceleration would be in the horizontal direction if they can apply that same kind of force to move horizontally, okay? And then what we said was they can't keep that acceleration up indefinitely. And so they're going to have this function here for acceleration. Okay, it's going to change in time. It's going to, it's going to decrease through exponential decay in time. So now what we have here is an acceleration that's a function of time, right? So our 1D kinematics aren't going to work here, right? Because our 1D kinematics were for accelerations that are constant in time. So that tool's not available to us, but our back of the envelope calculation doesn't have to stop there because we can go to a more fundamental idea, right? The uh, kinematic equations were an approximation, right, that assumes acceleration is constant. But the more fundamental idea is that x equals dv dt and v equals Or, sorry, I got that backwards. I'm, I'm already thinking about the integrals that we're about to do. Sorry, A equals dv dt and V equals dx dt, right? That was the fundamental idea that we had, was that velocity is the rate of change of position and acceleration is the rate of change of velocity, right? So then how does that help us now? Well, it tells us that if I want to get V, I just do the integral of A with respect to time, right? And in this case, A is A naught E to the minus T over tau. And all I have to do is integrate that, right? And that's not so hard. So A naught is a constant. It's just a number, which means that it can come out of the integral. And I'm just going to take the integral of this little piece here with respect to time. Okay? So then when I do that, I get minus a naught tau e to the minus t over tau. And then plus c, plus some constant. Okay? And then to figure out what this constant is, I have to think about what I'm solving here. So when they have this race, we're going to assume that they start from zero velocity. Okay, We're going to assume that they have a standing start, which means that v at t equals zero equals zero. And that means that zero equals minus a naught tau. And then e to the zero is going to be one, okay, plus c. And that tells us that c equals a naught tau. Okay? So then that means our expression for V is equal to A naught tau times 1 minus E to the minus T over tau. Not so bad, right? So let's put that up here. V equals a naught, oh, that's not a T. I think I said tau, but I wrote a T. That's a tau, right? A naught tau factored out times 1 minus E to the minus T over tau, right? Because C is A naught tau, and then, of course, this first term has an A naught tau, so I pull the A naught tau out, and then the C, all that's left is a 1, and it's 1 minus 
right? The negative sign here, and then this piece, e to the minus t over tau. Okay, and then if we want to find the position, we just do the same trick again, right? So then we're going to have x is the integral of v, right? Which is a naught tau 1 minus e to the minus t over tau dt, right? And in this thing, the only piece that has a time in it is this little guy right here, right? All the rest doesn't have a time. So this is, again, going to be pretty easy to integrate. And we're going to find that the integral is a naught tau t plus tau e to the minus t over tau plus c. Okay? And then we can do the same trick. We can say, okay, the runners are going to start from the position x equals 0. That's just a choice of coordinate system, right? We're just going to choose it such that x equals 0 is where they start from. So x at time 0 equals 0, which then equals, and then if we make t 0, what we get is a naught tau squared plus c, right? So therefore, c equals minus a naught tau squared, okay? And then that tells us that x is going to equal a naught tau times t minus tau, okay? That's the t from here. And then minus a naught tau squared would be minus a naught, or a naught tau times minus tau, right? We give minus a naught tau squared, okay? And then plus tau e to the minus t over tau. Okay? And that's going to be our position. So let's put that up here. x equals a naught tau t to the minus tau plus tau e to the minus t over tau. So then what I did is I took this v and I put it into uh, an app on my phone that just allows me to plot functions. And I plotted it, and it looks like, kind of like this, okay? It asymptotically approaches some velocity, all right? And what happens is, at about seven seconds into the race, Usain Bolt is at nearly his top speed, okay? Very close to his top speed. And the speed that he's at, if I plug in the numbers that we found, is VU equals... 12.23 meters per second, okay? And if I do the same thing for the cat, I plot this, this velocity function for the cat, and I find the value for it at 7 seconds, or if I just plug in 7 for the time here, right? 7 seconds. What I find for the cat, again, the cat at 7 seconds is nearly at its maximum velocity, and for the cat, we have a velocity of 13.23 meters per second. So now this, I think, is something pretty cool, okay? So we said, all right, the top speed that cats can get is 13.4 meters per second. And we said the top speed that Usain Bolt can get is 12.28 meters per second. And those are just values. And then what we did was... We completely ignored those, and we just did a back-of-the-envelope calculation. We said, how high can they jump? And then that means they can produce this much force. And then that means if they produce that force horizontally, they'll have this acceleration. And then we said, but their acceleration doesn't isn't constant. It's going to decay exponentially, right? And just through very simple application of the tools that you learned in this class, we can come up with this crazy function for the position of each of these racers in the race, right? I think that's pretty cool. And not only that, 
The velocity portion of what we've figured out, right, it looks a little bit crazy too, but it produces results that almost exactly match what these measured results were in real time, okay? In that race that I looked at for reference, Usain Bolt reached his top speed at almost exactly seven seconds into the race, and his top speed was this top speed, and we found that we reproduced the very same thing, okay? And we did it through simple application of tools from this class, okay? That's pretty fun, and that's pretty cool to come up with, all right? And then the cat, using the same tools that we came up with for Usain, the cat, we can also get very close to its top speed, okay? And that's where these tows came in. These tows dictate the, the steepness of this curve, basically. And so we can adjust those tows a little bit to make sure that we come up with the right speed. All right? So our little thought experiment is producing some really nice results. So now let's go back to our original question. If these two ran a 25 meter race, how far behind would Usain be at the end of the 25 meter race? Well, if I plot this, when x is 25 meters, t is equal to 3.347 seconds, okay? I'm not going to solve for t because it's going to be a pain in the ass, all right? But if I just plot it, I can see what t is when the y value, what we called x in this case, right? The distance is 25 meters, okay? And we know the cat's going to finish first. So this is going to be the time, right? And then what I can do is I can take that time and I can plug it into the version of distance for Usain Bolt and just see where is Usain Bolt after 3.347 seconds, okay? And the answer is the position of Usain at, the, at that time is 22.24 meters, okay? So a couple things to point out here. First, notice this time is a lot different than the time if we just assume that they both run at their top speed for 25 meters straight, right? If they both just run at the, their top speed for a full 25 meters, the time that it takes the cat to finish is only 1.9 seconds, okay? That's way, way less than what we actually see when they have to accelerate their bodies, right? So our back of the envelope calculation here where we use their vertical leap and the force they created and all that stuff, it's a much better approximation to what actually happens than them just running at their top speed, all right? This is a much, much better approximation. Okay, so Usain, when the cat is at 25 meters, is at 24.24 meters, which means that he now loses Usain loses by 2.76 meters, okay? And in this case, this is an even bigger loss than when we just took the top speeds and ran them over 25 meters, right? And so now he loses by about nine feet. So the fastest man in the world loses an 82 foot race by about nine feet. So a pretty sizable gap, about 10% the distance of the race is what he loses by, okay? And we got some really nice approximations just through simple application of tools that we learned in this class. And the hardest part really was doing these integrals, right? You just have to know how to integrate e to the x, okay? But other than that, it was all pretty simple little back of the envelope calculations. You really can do this with like a scientific calculator and a piece of paper, okay? You don't need a computer or anything like that. Um, I didn't use anything like that. I use, I honestly, I solved this with um, my scientific calculator that I have on my phone, and it's a scientific and graphing calculator, because remember, I plotted these to save myself time in doing algebra that was going to be a pain in the ass. And a piece of paper. That was it. Okay. So now let's look at one more thing, right? I, I just want to look at one more thing uh using our tools through the, the lens of cats, okay? And 
what I want to consider is completely separate from what we just considered. So we just considered kind of the speed of a cat, of an average cat, and compared it to the speed of the fastest person alive, okay? So now, let's look at something else. Imagine that I have a cat held upside down like this, okay? And when I let go of the cat, it falls through the air, okay? And it's upside down. It's falling through the air. And what happens? We all know what happens, right? Cats always land on their feet. So it lands on the ground like this, right? But conservation of angular momentum, Li equals Lf, remember conservation of angular momentum said that if there's no external torques acting on an object, then its angular momentum won't change, right? So if the cat is falling here, it's not spinning at all here, and the only outside force acting on it is gravity, right? There aren't any other forces. We don't really need to take in air drag into account for a cat, right, that's falling some short distance. So it's really just gravity that's acting on this. And gravity, remember, acts as if it's acting on the center of mass of the object. So by definition, it's not, if it's not off center from the center of mass, it's not going to apply a torque, right? It's just pulling all of the cat straight down. It doesn't apply any torque at all. So then, if the cat's angular velocity is zero at the start, right, it's not spinning at all, and we just said that there aren't any external torques acting on this cat, okay? There aren't any forces to apply external torques. The laws of physics tell us that the cat's angular velocity must be zero all the time, right? It has to remain zero. That's a law of physics. That's conservation of angular momentum. But we know that the cat flips over, right? We've seen it done. So what's going on here? How, how is this happening? Well, I can tell you right away that even cats can't violate the laws of physics, okay? So the question is, how does the cat turn over without violating conservation of angular momentum? Okay? And one answer that people come up with is that the cat spins its tail in the opposite direction. Now, a cat's tail makes up way less than 1 20th of the cat's mass, okay? So how fast would a cat have to spin its tail for that to be the method of turning the cat over? Let's kind of calculate that out for a second. So let's say that the mass of the cat, we're going to keep using it 4 kilograms. And then we're going to say the mass of the tail is equal to 1 20th the mass of the cat. And how I picked 1 20th is 1 20th is 5%. Okay? And um, a cat's mass is not 5% tail. Right? It's way less than 5%. But we're going to make the tail way heavier than it is in real life just to have kind of an exaggerated uh, effect. Okay? So whatever angular velocity we come up with that it would have to spin its tail at, um, it's actually would have to spin it even much faster than what we're going to calculate here in order to turn over, okay? So the idea is if the cat spins his tail, so if we're looking straight on on the cat like this, okay, and his little tail sticking up, if he spins his tail this way, then to have zero angular momentum, his body would have to spin this way, right? Because the two spins would have to cancel for angular momentum to be zero. Because we can add the vectors, right? And the vectors, remember, go by right-hand rule. So if I have a vector pointing this way, the spin around this vector would be around like this, right? Where uh, this line is going in front of the arrow, right? So right-hand rule sends that whatever arrow I make the, th the spin is counterclockwise around that arrow, okay? So if, I, if the arrow was coming right at me, right? So if this is the point of the arrow and my vector is pointing out of the page, right-hand rule says this, okay? So this says if the cat's tail was spinning in a direction where the vector points into the page, this picture here, 
says if the cat's tail is spinning in a direction where the vector points into the page, then the cat would spin in the direction where the vector points out of the page, okay? And those two vectors would add up to zero, and that would keep the angular momentum zero, okay? Because that's the whole trick of this. The cat has no angular momentum at the start of the fall, so whatever the cat's doing in the air, all of the angular momenta have to add up to be a zero angular momentum, okay? So let's try this tail trick. Let's see how fast it would have to spin its tail like this. So let's suppose that the cat falls some distance d, and d equals one meter, okay? And in that one meter, it turns 180 degrees, okay? So theta equals 180 degrees equals pi radians, right? And 180 degrees means it, it flips from legs pointed in the up in the air to legs pointed at the ground, right? That's all we're saying. It just flips so that its legs are pointed in the ground. And they actually generally turn over much, much faster than this, right? If you drop the cat a meter, it wouldn't barely turn over in time for its feet to hit the ground. It turns over within the first, like, few inches of its fall, okay? It turns over much faster than this. But, again, we're giving this, this theory its best chance of potentially producing a reasonable value of tailspin by making the cat turn over slower and making the tail have more mass than it actually has, okay? So let's say from 1D kinematics then that our time to fall for this one meter, well, T is going to equal 2x over G in a root, right? Uh, this is just kind of assuming zero velocity at the start of this one meter. And then X is going to be D, which is one meter. So let's just say that our time to fall is going to be 2 over G in a root, okay? We're going to plug the, the 1 in right now. So we have a nice simple value for T. And then the radians that the cat goes through are pi radians, right? So the angular velocity of the cat is going to equal pi over t, which is going to be pi times g over 2 in a root, right? And the units work on this because, remember, there's meters in the top here. This is 2 times meters. Okay? And then so the angular momentum here of the cat, of the cat's body, is L cat equals I omega, right? That's just by definition. But then let's call the cat a solid cylinder. So we're going to model the cat and its body as just a solid cylinder. Now, is that a perfect model? No, obviously not. But it's not bad, right? A cat is kind of a cylindrical shaped object-ish. So we're going to call it that and we're going to let I then equal one half m r squared, where r is this radius of the, the circular part of the cylinder, right? And so then we have to come up with r, where r is some kind of a, a representative uh, radius of a cat, okay? And so we're going to say r equals 8 centimeters, all right? That's probably kind of a big cat, but um, whatever. We're going to say it's 8 centimeters, okay? And then so this L of cat equals pi over 2 m r squared g over 2 in a root, okay? So that's the angular momentum of the cat. And then conservation of angular momentum tells us that LC plus L tail equals zero, because that's what it was at the beginning, right? LI is zero. And then LF is the angular momentum while it's flipping over, okay? And so whatever direction the cat spins. So we have LC's pi over 2 m r squared g over 2. Whatever direction the cat spins, the tail is going to spin the other way, right? And then that's going to equal 0. So then let's think about the tail for a second. The tail we can model as kind of a long rod or a stick, right? And then it's going to spin 
about one end like this, right? So then it's going to spin around like this, around an axis on the end of the stick. And the moment of inertia for a stick spinning around one end like this is one-third m l squared, where l is the length of the tail. So let's say that the tail is 0 0.3 meters, okay? About a foot long. I guess just over a foot. So let's say that's the length of the tail. Okay, so then lt is going to be one-third ml squared i, right, times omega, where omega is the angular uh, velocity of the tail. And that equals zero now. So then that tells us that pi over 2 mr squared g over 2 in a root is equal to 1 third m l squared. Oh, omega t. And then remember that this m is 1 20th the mass of the cat, and this m is the mass of the cat, right? mc. So we can replace this, and this 1 third times 1 20th is going to be 1 60th mc, okay? And then the mcs are going to cancel, and we're going to get that omega of the tail equals 60 pi over 2 r over l, that quantity squared, g over 2. And that's equal to 14.8 radians per second. Okay? And this is around two and a half spins a second. Okay? So that's a tail spinning pretty fast. And this was assuming that we had a much heavier tail than a cat actually has. And this was assuming that the cat flips over much slower than it actually does. Okay? So this isn't really working. Right? This is, a, this is a tail sticking straight out, spinning pretty fast. And indeed, if we watch a slow motion video of a cat flipping over, they don't spin their tail wildly. Okay, So the, the tail hypothesis is out. So let's watch a video of one of my cats, Pip, landing on her feet after I dropped her upside down. Okay, And for this first time that we watched the video, just notice that she doesn't really move her tail very much at all, okay? Okay, so if the tail hypothesis is out, let's describe what's actually going on here, all right? And the key to the cat flipping over is really the incredible flexibility of the cat's spine, okay, the cat's back. So let's approximate the cat as a cylinder again, but now let's approximate it as two solid cylinders that look like this. Okay? So now what we're showing, I'm just going to tell you, this is the way that it actually works, okay? So now, these two cylinders, imagine that they're exact, and the cat's going to spin, and they're connected, so the spins, by right-hand rule, have to look like this, okay? So that if you can imagine this one spinning, by right-hand rule, spinning around like this, right? And then that means that this one is spinning around like this, okay? And you can see that that must be the way because we know with the cat, these two cylinders are connected, right? So these two little spots here, they have to be spinning in the same direction at, the, at about the same speed, right? And these two spin vectors, they create that situation where uh, at that point where the things connect, they're going to spin with the same speed and in the same direction, okay? And then let's say that this angle between them, theta equals... 45 degrees, okay? And then that means this angle, phi, is 45 degrees, and this angle is also phi, 
45 degrees, okay? Or, sorry, theta between them here is 90 degrees, not 45 degrees, 90 degrees. So they're each at a 45 degree angle above the horizontal, okay? So since these two cylinders are identical, and they have the same omega, the same angular velocity, that means that L1 equals L2, okay? And we'll call this L1 and this L2. So then let's put in a coordinate system. We're just going to put in X horizontal and Y vertical. And then as vectors, we can always just add uh, angular momentum vectors, right? So we just add them by components. So let's do the Y direction first, okay? And in the Y hat direction, the L2 that's pointed, or let's start with L1. The L1 that's pointed in the Y hat would be this guy, right? And that's going to be L1 sine phi, right? And then the L2 that's pointed in the Y direction is going to be like this, right? It's going to point down. And so we're going to have minus L2 sine phi. And remember, because these cylinders are identical and they have the same angular velocity, L1 equals L2. And so then this piece down here, that just equals zero, right? I'm not forcing it to equal zero, it just does. They just happen, the one points up and one points down, and they have the same magnitude, okay? And so they're zero. But then let's look in the x hat direction. And in the x hat direction, I'm going to have L1 cos phi, right? It's going to point this way, the positive x. But then in L2, the x direction also points in the positive x, right? I need a, the vectors to point like this if I'm going to create a vector that looks like this, right? So in this case, it's plus L2 cos phi. And that means that this is not 0, right? This is going to produce some positive uh, angular momentum, right? Which means that the angular momentum total for these two things spinning like this goes around this way, right? Counterclockwise around a vector that points to the right. Okay? So then if I look at kind of head on at this, the cylinders create an angular velocity that spins this way, right? And this isn't going anywhere, right? This is just these two cylinders spinning like this. The system isn't turning around or turning over. But they create this angular velocity that's counterclockwise, which means that conservation of momentum, of angular momentum, tells me that I'm going to have an angular momentum that goes the other way for the whole system, right? Because this spin gives the whole system this angular momentum then I'm going to have to have another angular momentum that goes the other way because of conservation of angular momentum, right, to make it zero. And indeed, what happens is when I spin these two cylinders like that, then what the whole thing, the V shape, rolls over this other way, okay? So um, if this, okay, if the V shape is this and then it goes back here, the spinning of these things like this causes the whole thing to turn over like this, okay? It causes the little point of the V to turn over. And so what happens is the cat folds itself up in this kind of V shape and spins its body on itself and then that causes angular momentum which is balanced out by turning this whole V over okay and this is actually how cats manage to turn over and land on their feet without violating conservation of angular momentum so let's watch the video of Pip again okay now my wife and I didn't get a perfect angle on this and I used to have a video of this where I did this and Pip looked exactly like our little two-cylinder diagram okay it could not have been more perfect and it was really obvious, um, but I lost it. It was on a phone that just stopped working and I lost the video. 
and my wife and I didn't want to just keep dropping pip until we got the perfect shot. So this is the video we have. Okay, so we got to work with what we got here. So when I play the video, I want you to pay attention to a couple of specific things. Okay, first, notice that as I hold pip upside down, she's already curling her body up into a little V in anticipation of needing to flip over. Okay, so you can see when I hold her up, she's already kind of curling up into a little ball. She's already bending her spine, so she makes a little V out of her body. Okay, and then second, if you watch right as the slow motion ends, you can see that her back is arched back the other way, right? Like she's sticking her little belly out because her little belly is then the bottom of the V shape, right? And the V shape flips over as she spins her body, okay, as she spins her body on itself. And then that's, she's got her kind of belly sticking out right before she flattens out and puts her feet down to land, okay? And then lastly, notice that as she goes to spin and turn over in the air, she takes her legs and she holds them close to her body, okay? This is like the ice skater pulling her hands in to spin faster. By keeping her legs close to her body during the spin, she's reducing her moment of inertia and making it take less effort to spin around, right? And then... Uh, you'll notice that Ed, because she reduces her inertia like this and because they have really flexible spines and really powerful little muscles You'll notice she turns over from upside down to right side up in a matter of You know not even half a meter a third of a meter probably right a few inches so she uh, she falls a distance of mm, Six or eight inches probably while turning over maybe more maybe it's like a foot, but it's not very far Right? She turns over really fast using this method. And really, the key to it for cats is that they have uh, really powerful little muscles, really great reflexes, and they have this really flexible spine that allows them to do this little V action with their body. Now, humans could start to do something similar because we could fold our legs up and make a V, right? But we can't really keep our body spinning and turn that V over very well because we can't arch our back back the other way, right? And so the key for Pip as she does this is that she's already, she's kind of doing like a sit up, right? Putting her body into a V before I even let her go. And when I let her go, she's able to arch her back back the other way as the V turns over to get her turned all the way over and land on her feet nice and easy, okay? So here's the video. And that concludes our lecture for today. We've had a little bit of fun considering the physics of cats, and in the process we put to use some of the tools that we've learned over the course of the semester. And we can answer kind of interesting, cool little problems in surprisingly accurate ways, just using the tools that we learned in this introductory physics class. Our next lecture is gonna be another little mini review lecture like this, where we look at some of the physics involved in uh, just a couple things about cars as a way to, re to review some of the concepts that we learned this semester.